good morning friends uh, can you uh, see my slides yes sir yeah um, i'm audible too that is okay so thank you uh, dr dhanya for uh, the very kind introduction and uh, thank you uh, dr gilija for planning such a meticulous uh, program and uh, congratulations to little flower hospital to coordinate uh, to help you coordinate the whole uh, you know uh, cme program uh, i have been asked to talk on uh, medical management of open angle glaucoma uh newer horizons and special scenarios so uh i will uh, talk in the reverse order and i'll first talk to you about the special scenarios and start off with uh, management medical management of glaucoma in pregnant and breastfeeding patients now uh glaucoma is a disease of the elderly on the other hand pregnancy and lactating mothers are usually on the lower age group though the scenario is changing so how do we uh, solve this dilemma actually uh, this a uh, questionnaire was uh, shared with the british ophthalmologists uh, uh, and uh, uh, the survey was performed and the results were published in i 2007 which basically addressed more of the the, the the issues which we really need to know when managing these cases the results were quite interesting you know more than one fourth of the uh, surveyed doctors had previously encountered uh, this scenario in the practice and uh, unfortunately more than one third of these patient these doctors were not sure about what treatment option they would choose and there are a lot of other interesting findings in this particular uh, you know the article but uh, it concluded that there is a general level of uncertainty among ophthalmologists about this uh, situation and it recommended that there has to be consensus guidelines which have to evolve depending upon uh, future uh, evidence based research so what exactly is the challenge you know these mothers are on anti glaucoma medications so which uh, go to the plasma and then they may cause the blood plasma uh, present a barrier and result in teratogenicity and phytotox and uh, phytotoxicity for for the for the fetus so many a time uh, a mother may either become non compliant or we really have to decide as to what exactly to be is to be done to manage this patient so this is the challenge and again there was a special commentary uh, published in um, the ophthalmology journal a practical guide to the pregnant and breastfeeding patient with glaucoma so whenever we consider any medication for uh, a pregnant uh, 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 patient you know uh, we need to uh, refer uh, to this uh, fda risk uh, drug risk categories in pregnancy this was established in uh, 1979 this five letter system for categorization of patients for for the different drugs for the risk category and and this is valid only for drugs uh, which were released which are approved till june 30 2001 Medi medications which came later on there is another system to to you know categorize them so basically uh, category a means you know these medicines are the safest and well controlled studies in pregnant women have not shown an increased risk of fetal abnormalities on the other hand as you go down to group uh, category e there is evidence of fetal abnormalities in the well controlled studies in animals or humans so they are absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy so all the glaucoma medications that we use most of them belong to category c and it's only brimonidine uh, which belongs to category b if you see the gsa uh, guidelines which were released sometime back you know it, it basically uh, informs tells you about the individual medications and their uh, teratogenicity their their after adverse effects on the fetus etc so please refer to that now uh, looking into uh, what uh, we sh should be doing now if we have a patient uh, in uh, who is on glaucoma medications and we have to decide which medication to choose i think in the first and second week of uh, the trimester second trimester of the pregnancy Brimonidine is uh, a drug uh, or which belongs to category B. Apraclonidine is no no longer available here. So beta blockers could be used uh, in the first and second trimester. Uh, we try to avoid uh, it during closer to the delivery because of its uh, neonatal effects. Uh, prostaglandin analogs again, you know, are a, a good uh, medication to go to. Uh, they should uh, be used uh, only at the third and possibly second because of the risk of early labor. Uh, they can in, in, they can induce uterine contract, uh, contractions. The newer prostaglandins, uh, they like Visul, etc. They should not be used. 
Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, again, they belong to category, category C and they can be used in late second and early third trimester of pregnancy. Uh, Rho canus in, uh, inhibitor, again, there is, uh, it doesn't belong to any category, so it's better to withhold these medications. Now, after having tided over uh, the pregnancy, uh, now the, the lactating mother or the breastfeeding mother, uh, brimonidine, which was indicated for uh, the pregnant, uh, preg during pregnancy is contraindicated because we know that it is capable of uh, CNS depression, apnea, uh, lethargy, and bradycardia in the, in the child, in the, in, in the infant. Beta blockers can be used safely, but we need to exercise utmost caution in infants with cardiopulmonary disease. Prostaglandin analogs other than Visulta, and I'll be talking about these medications later on, are likely safe. They have a very short half-life. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are also safe. Pilocarpine, the, the long-term effects are not really known. And again, the rho canus inhibitors, there is no data available. Now, if it comes to that situation where a medic, the intraocular pressure is not controlled, the mother's uh, glaucoma is going up, the, the, the damage to the structure and function is, is, is continuing, you know, we may consider selective laser trabeculoplasty, which may eliminate the medication burden. If not, it may decrease the medication burden. But remember that it requires an open angle and it is less effective in these uh, younger uh, patients. Uh, in certain situations, surgery have to be considered, avoiding the first uh, uh, trimester. You know, the, again, you know, surgical, there are challenges because these are young patients and there's, a, there's increased risk of failure, more fibrosis in these patients. You know, what anesthesia, uh, preferably it has to be topical anesthesia. Then the question about the postoperative antibiotics, anti-inflammatory drops again proper. And it may be difficult for a patient, uh, to a pregnant patient, to lie in a supine position without any hypotony for a long period of time. So uh, basically, uh, we, uh, in summary, uh, uh, we need to uh, talk to the patient even before the patient has considered uh, the, the pregnancy. You know, there has to be a detailed discussion about the treatment goals, what are the target IOP, what are the treatment options, depending upon the categories that I've mentioned, and the treatment strategy. Because sometimes in a pregnancy, the intraocular pressure goes down by about one or four millimeters of mercury. Sometimes because it is a limited period of time, you know, a couple of months, so we may have, we may succeed, we may succeed in stopping therapy, uh, at the same time monitoring for glaucoma progression in the mother. So basically all these discussions should be held with the patient, with the family, and the, the entire healthcare team, including the obstetrician, the pediatrician, and whoever is you know, part of the team. Uh, so pregnancy, I just mentioned, might alter the course of glaucoma. So a tailored close uh, uh, and close follow-up is recommended. Uh, so uh, before itself, before pregnancy itself, you know, we should be able to identify the drops which can be safely administered and have a plan of action, you know, whether the patient will require uh, SLT or patient can continue with uh, pregnancy without uh, much interference from our side. And whenever drops are used, you know, they have to be used with uh, nasolacrimal op uh, occlusion and uh, lead occlusion. Uh, particularly when, for a nursing mother, it should be used immediately after the breastfeeding is over, uh, not before that. Uh, glaucoma surgery is rarely indicated. And, you know, uh, and sometimes when the patients ask about uh, what could be done to, you know, to mitigate uh, or, or to avoid the worsening of, uh, of uh, glaucoma in them, uh, so uh, there is nothing they need to do, like, for example, sleeping position, delivery method of choice are unlikely to cause any clinically meaningful intraocular pressure increase. So this is about uh, uh, managing a patient, uh, the, the uh, glaucoma patient in a pregnancy when she is breastfeeding. And next, we move on to the pediatric age. Uh, we all agree that, you know, it is basic pediatric glaucoma is a surgical disease and, and it is the mainstay of the treatment. Uh, for uh, uh, surgery is the mainstay of the treatment for these young people. However, uh, medications also have been found to be very useful, uh, both as a long-term measure or a temporary measure. These are all the indications that are mentioned here. Now, uh, there was the big study, a British Infantile and Glaucoma uh, study, which was published in IVS in September 2007, uh, which, uh, which emphasized that medical treatment definitely has to be uh, should not be relegated to the background. It will be useful in many situations. For example, you know, 71 percent of the patients with primary surgery, uh, without a full IOP, uh, without hitting at the target IOP, will re receive intraocular pressure, receive anti glaucoma medications uh, during the first one year follow up. And you know, the percentage of patients where the treatment has been started, uh, percent percent of the partially successful surgery patient where treatment 
with anti-glaucoma medication has been started increases from 60% to 94%. So that is a significant number. Then medications can be used preoperatively to control IOP or in between two surgeries. And sometimes when the patient is a poor of surgical risk, it is the only option. Now, uh, as opposed to uh, the adult glaucoma, you know, we, we don't have, uh, uh, we need to have an evidence-based consensus guidelines to, to have, you know, uh, a treatment strategy for the pediatric age group. Now, in adult glaucoma, uh, this uh, subject has been well studied and there are two meta-analyses. One included 28 RCTs of glaucoma monotherapy, another one 48, 41 RCTs. So you basically have a good evidence-based based approach, which is lacking in the pediatric age group. So this particular article, Graph is uh, Clinical Ophthalmology, uh, it, it looked into it and, and it is easy to understand why so much of uh, literature is, is lacking in this uh, particular field because pediatric glaucoma is not a common situation. So the evidences are mere, meager. There are ethical concerns uh, uh, while trying to conduct this, uh, a, a, a RCT on uh, these uh, young people. And then it is a very time consuming and, uh, and uh, infrastructure requiring you know, uh, workup. So that is the reason only there are only uh, five uh, you know, RCTs that also not very well planned RCTs where they're available in the literature. I'll not go into the details, but what I'd like to tell you that See, are these, these RCTs basically have a consensus that, you know, the effectivity or the pressure lowering uh, effectivity of uh, the medications are similar to the adult population. Uh, the, the number percentage of responders are significantly reduced as opposed to the adults in children. There are safety concerns because the serum concentration um, builds up uh, uh, to a higher level than the adults because there is reduced volume of plasma. And because of the concentration of the principal plasma binding, uh, reduced concentration of the principal plasma binding proteins in these young uh, patients. For example, uh, with respect to Timolol, you know, intravenous administration and ocular administration gives almost the same uh, plasma level. And children receiving 0.25% uh, of Timolol can achieve a higher plasma concentration compared to adults who are receiving 0.5% uh, Timolol. Prostaglin analogs again have a very good uh, safety profile. So again, you know, looking at these uh, five uh, uh, RCTs, we see that Timolol uh, had about 25% uh, uh, pressure lowering effici efficiency. On the other hand, the prostaglin and analogs did better, latanoprost and trivoprost, they did better. So the, uh, in the light of the potential systemic side effects, it is important to minimize the absorption of the drug, especially when using beta blockers. So use the lowest con concentration, preferably use a gel formation and use lacrimal punctal occlusion. And prostaglandins have become the most commonly prescribed monotherapy for the management of childhood glaucoma. While using prostaglandins in FAQ patients, of course, uh, the controversy stays whether uh, the what have, whether macular edema occurs or not. But then, you know, it has, if the patient is uh, well controlled with PGAs, uh, my go-to medication will be a prostaglin analog to control the intraocular pressure. While, while a beta blockers, you know, it is best avoided in premature and small infants. Uh, it is a good idea to use 0.25% timolol and epitaxolol actually has a better systemic adverse effect profile but does not lower the intraocular pressure that much. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors uh, are the first or second line uh, therapy in young children. Lorzolamide 2% or benzolamide 1% uh, three times a day. And, uh, you know, severe adverse effects like metabolic acidosis are not very commonly seen for topical therapy. Oral or IV therapy is not approved for use in children. Though of course, there could be an off-label use. Again, uh, coming back to the alpha-2 agonist, bimonidine, uh, it should not be used in infants and children less than seven years and uh, with weight less than 20 kilograms. So friends, uh, uh, it is also very important that after initiating the therapy, the patient has to be monitored properly. So the general examination becomes very important. We need to look into the patient's vital signs and patient alertness particularly uh, the patient on uh, beta blockers. And sometimes we need to have a good feedback from the parents or uh, the family members and report uh, and actively look for uh, these uh, exp adverse experiences um, that the child might go through. And then sometimes it may be useful or it may be necessary to monitor uh, the patient's care along with uh, an experienced clinician's, uh, clinician and uh, to find out whether there's problems, the adverse effects are due to the eye drops and then decide whether the eye drop should be continued or we should change into a different eye drop. And of course, the ocular examination should continue. And uh, for, uh, for us to evaluate the patient properly, measure the intraocular pressure, 
together, up to now, where you know examination under anesthesia may be.